Series two, episode eight. Mark Saltbite, my friend, Mark, my, my buddy, my buddy. I saw you, you did a tweet about last time you were in England a couple of months yeah. ago. You did an angry tweet that somebody had called you buddy and you hated it. So, uh, so I thought I'd call well, you Well, it, it seems condescending, doesn't it? Yeah, how's that feel? It depends how it's said. I don't think I've ever seen a British person call another British person buddy, except in a condescending way or to maybe an eight-year-old boy. But Americans see, are routinely called buddy, and it's hard not to take that as negative. And so it got you angry. Uh, angry enough angry to tweet. Is a strong word. I don't get angry about a whole lot other than, you know, fascist coups trying to take over my country, that kind of thing. But that, that happens every so uh, often. Yeah. It's annoying. Also, I am a comedian, so I'm always looking for, you know, the stock and trade of comedy is minor annoyances. It's not so much real anger. But, uh, you know, and there's a definite cultural translation issue. Sometimes I do this stuff just to work out the cultural translation. I'm just like wondering out loud and looking for the crowd to tell me if I'm on the right track or wrong or not. So well, we, we call each other, what do we call each other? Mate, I, I should say Clara's here. Mate. Hello, Clara. Hi. <laughs> There's Hi, mate. Clara. Hey, mate. <laughs> you okay, buddy? In the United States mate means is a verb meaning to breed with someone we're just obviously all really good friends in the uk <laughs> <laughs> well that's very trendy now the whole polyamorous thing i'm not really into that but whatever anybody else is into that's fine but yeah mate is uh in a homophobic society to hear men calling each other mate is like what <laughs> i don't even think it works that way you can try but i don't think you're gonna procreate well, we still have the same verb, but we still call each other mate. <laughs> yeah. What, what, do you, what do you do then, Mark? What do you call your friends? Uh, well, I call them by their name. <laughs> <laughs> it's only polite. <laughs> the, the generic thing always strikes me as what you do when you forget someone's name. Right? Like, mm -hmm. I'm really bad at remembering names, and I meet a lot of people. So, you know, hey, pal, hey, buddy. Uh, but most of them are a little condescending like especially ones like uh, the, the things you say to little boys like hey tiger hey scooter how's it going um, how you doing yeah, champ? champ you get them champ <laughs> exactly that's what that's what buddy feels like to me and you can tell people are doing it because they hear my accent and they go oh he's american i should call him buddy and and, and i'm trying to figure out how to upgrade myself from buddy to me that's it, you just got mate envy. Uh, yeah, it, uh, absolutely. Absolutely. I want to be mating with everyone in England. All right, moving on. <laughs> <laughs> so we've already done a very long podcast about palindromes, which is obviously yes. our, our mutual passion. So, so that's done. That's, yeah, that's series one, episode 23, I think. So it's three hours long. It took four and a half hours to record, which was a long time. I think yeah, that's no good. one can believe that we cut 50% of it or 33% of it. Well, the best one, it, I, I did uh, an episode, it was the second episode I did with Christian Book. We recorded oh. it for over four hours and, wow. and only just under two hours made it in. Uh, during that four hours, I managed to drink five bottles of wine. And I, think, <laughs> I think Christian was keeping up with me and basically we didn't use anything from the last hour. Because not surprisingly, was, but it, it might have been easy. the most fun. Yeah. I think what you're supposed to do is start an insider's club and then only release the last hour to people who pay the extra money on Patreon or whatever. I think I'd have no friends left if people heard that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we've done so we covered palindromes, and, and I encourage everybody to go back and listen to that episode. But we are going to mention palindromes again, sort of, because we're trying to plug something here sure so let's get get on with that straight away let's talk about it okay. this is palindrome fight at the edinburgh That's fringe right. this year at wow. the kilderkin 1930 yeah. do you say 1930 or 7 30 p.m 7 30 p.m i think okay good, good. 7 30 p.m is that how i like to think of it not having been in the military but yes every night except tuesdays through the month of august or specifically the 6th through the 28th. 
Excellent. And, and uh, Clara and I will be there for the first week. Yes. Before we Very exciting. I'm lining up so many guests all through the whole thing. My my ideal is that I never am a panelist through the whole month and just take on the MC duties. It's probably unrealistic. People will flake out or not show up at the last second, but uh, that's my goal. So do you want to explain the premise of palindrome fight? Sure. It's live improv palindrome. So like most improv shows, the audience gives three suggestions at the beginning and the panelists respond to fit, except in this case, they respond with original palindromes they wrote on the occasion. And uh, obviously that's not something you're going to do off the top of your head. So to give people at least half an hour to work, um, we will mix uh, performances, whether it's stand-up comedy, poetry, or my tellings of lurid palindrome history from my 25 years of research on the topic uh, to chew up half an hour. And then the panelists will come back and present whatever they've managed to scratch together during that time. Does that sound about right? Yeah, that sounds pretty good. Uh, can we mention some of the confirmed participants obviously i'll be there sure um comedian curtis cook from los angeles is coming out comedian eric dryblatt from uh vermont is coming out we have a lot of tentatively confirmed people and i'm a little less comfortable throwing that out there i don't want to put pressure on them or make it sound like we're failing to deliver on promises i should have looked up that file why don't you guys speak among yourselves while I do that? Well, we can say that uh, we've got a couple of poets mm -hmm. coming. Pedro Port Evan and Chris Kerr. Mm -hmm. And am I forgetting someone? Harry Ray. Yeah. For the 17th, 19th and 21st of August. We think that Melina Cervedo is going to be there, but I don't know if she's going to participate. Mm. OK. Anthony Schumann. A United States comedian is going to be out there. I believe Susan Loind, another United States comedian, is confirmed. And then uh, we have a bunch of tentative people. Like I say, I'm hesitating there, but some really great comedians. We're going to see if there's enough internet bandwidth that we might be able to do a, a, a Zoom show bringing in some of our friends, such as Martin Clear from Australia and John Agee from San Francisco and Lori Wyke from Salt Lake City. But I hate to present, you know, to, to promise that because I haven't been to the venue and there's going to be probably 10,000, 20,000 people swarming all around that neighborhood using up all of the Wi-Fi possible. I thought we were going to say swarming around our venue. There's 20,000 people well, trying yeah, to get in. Yeah. It, it's it's one room of a bar that might be a bit larger than the legally allowed capacity, you know. So you're just going to need to show up early, and and wait in line or come back for another night. But uh, we'll 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 find a way to make it work for you. Yeah, we've got a small venue to to give everybody else a yes. chance. Yes, but I should also add that we do have some panel slots open for punters. I think you would say. Uh, for, for just randos who attend the show or just want to, you know, if, if you're not sure you can get a seat, you can always be on the panel. You'll have to come up with a, the improv palindromes, but then you're guaranteed a chair. Yeah, that's the cost of entry. Yeah. <laughs> yes, small price. So th this show, essentially, it's, well, it's, it's a palindrome show, but it's really a comedy show, I would say, yeah. overall, because... We're not expecting great palindromes if you've got the short period right. of time to write them. And sometimes, the, as you've said to me in the past, when you've done, because you've, of course you've done this before in other venues. Yes. The bad palindromes are sometimes the best because they're so The bad most entertaining, behind. certainly. Right. They're the funniest. I think it's funnier to see someone desperately struggle to justify a terrible palindrome yeah. than to just drop a little line of poetry. <laughs> No, no offense to the poets, and we will have some some proper poetry as as part of the show, 
but, oh, but well, I'm, odds... I'm going for I'm going for humor. I think I'm going to say okay, humor. good. Well, they're not mutually exclusive as well. I mean, what is a palindrome if not the marriage of humor and poetry? Well, I'm, I'm playing out a stand-up comic fantasy. You know, I, I was never a stand comedian because I was oh, okay. too nervous. So, but I get to feel like one this time. Right. Well, and I suppose that's what I'm doing with palindromes is playing out my poet fantasy. Yeah. <laughs> and. And for the un uninitiated who might be feeling brave, will there be any pointers or quick tutorials oh, yes. at the start? That is a wonderful question. Clara will be tutoring everyone. <laughs> <laughs> she just found out right now. Um, no, I have a cheat sheet that I freely distribute to people. And during the show, um, I and presumably you two as well, will be going amongst the panelists and actually coaching them and helping and offering tips. We just did a, a version of the palindrome fight that you two weren't able to attend at uh, Will Shorts's American Crossword Puzzle Tournament in Connecticut this year. And, you know, I spent half the time going around coaching the people. We had three volunteers from the audience. Eric Dryblatt, who's coming to Edinburgh, that was his first ever palindrome fight. He came down from Vermont, where I know him, because that's where I live. And he actually took second place. So he did very well in, in his first palindrome he's ever tried to create in his entire life. So I was circulating around, ah, oh, what do you try this, you know, or, you know, you could finish it off by putting in this word or instead of dividing the word that way, what if you divide it this way? I think you're going to find more endings for the word that's left over. Happy to do some live coaching, both during the event and in advance. Well, there's an incentive for people to come along because, you know, they get to yeah. hear from experts like me oh. and you. And Well, one thing I've considered doing on those occasions where I'm not one of the participants, that perhaps I might start the time-killing portion by analyzing the words that the audience has suggested, not only to kind of reveal to the audience the process of how this works, but also as a very open hint to any panelists who might be new to the game, hey, work on this. <laughs> what do you think? I just thought of that yesterday, walking down the street. Not bad. <laughs> and I know I you, think it might work. It, so I, I know you've done this show in, in the States a few times. Is, yeah. is this the premiere of Palindrome Fight in the UK? Ah, uh, good question. It is. Yes, unless you've done it. No. As far no. as I know. So this will be my first palindrome fight. Yeah. This week out well, the World Palindrome Championship. The, the, the world, I mean, it is based on uh, the World Palindrome Championship, to be fair. So uh, the first palindrome fight was just a month after the first World Palindrome Championship. I went back to Portland, Oregon, triumphant, of course. We had the parades. And then I organized a palindrome fight at a local place called the Peculiarium, which is an oddball store that has some live events. And John Agee and, and Martin zoomed in for that show, and a 12-year-old boy in the audience won. <laughs> With a palindrome that, frankly, I thought was kind of hacky. It had like a wolf flower. I'm like, oh, come on. Wolf flower? You guys are clapping for that? Come on! But, um, you know, 12 year old boy from the audience, it was irresistible to cheer him on. And so we'll probably see a bit of that during the palindrome fight as well. If there's a six year old girl, just put all your money on her. Yeah. Even if she just says poop, she's going to win. Well, uh, of course, there's the fact as well that rude words seem very well suited to palindromes. Yes, they do. They do indeed. Anyway, we should get to the, the subjects of this podcast. I, I'm worried that this is going to spiral like the last. All right. <laughs> last one. Yeah, we'll have none of that. What is the subject of this podcast, by the way? It's, well, it's you. I should have checked my email. <laughs> it's you. This is. The, oh, it's about OK. You. It's about. Well, yes, you. let's. By all means. Yeah. Well, more let's specifically, more specifically, it's about your career in stand up comedy. OK. So, and, and spiraling into other areas. I mean, it's kind of strange that, you know, I've become not only a, a freelance writer, which includes some comedic elements, but I've also become a scholar on the cheap without any advanced degrees. And that's kind of uh, my quest 
that I'm pursuing right now is how far can I go presenting academic papers at proper conferences and getting published? I'm working on a book proposal for the ultimate academic book on palindromes with no credentials whatsoever other than a bachelor's degree and but having studied it for 25 years. I mean, I really do know my shit, right? I'm not I'm not just making stuff up. Yeah, but it's, is it's it not a passing possible? fancy, is it? What's that? It's not a passing fancy. <laughs> no. You've been you've been no. focused on palindromes for a very long time. Right. But like I'm the only sibling in my family who does not have a master's degree of the four of us. So I'm I'm the least educated. And I'm trying to storm the gates of academia armed only with pluck. <laughs> That's all you need. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, and and hopefully the whole business is to me. I, I find it funny, just the endeavor of like, oh, yeah, you know, I'm actually calling up Princeton University Press and saying, I want to write an academic book. Good. What are your credentials? Well, <laughs> it's a great book. You should look at all the stuff I got. Just read it. <laughs> Don't ask for credentials. Yeah, right, right. They're being lazy asking for credentials. Like, credentials, schmidentials, do the work. Anyway, already this is just going to be digression after digression. This happened last time you were on the podcast. I'm going to have That's to bring you in. What a weird coincidence. What a weird coincidence. <laughs> <laughs> okay, here's a question. I'm going to give you a question. Yeah. We're going to answer it. <laughs> okay. So well, how do you start with, with comedy? Oh, excellent idea and, and a good answer for a British audience. Um, I was 38 years old in a bad and dying marriage, and I had never really been that interested in stand-up comedy. I mean, I had a couple albums because I'm old, you know, Steve Martin, probably Robin Williams, Cheech and Chong, whatever, but it's, it was never my big thing. And in 1998, some friends dragged me to see Eddie Izzard, or as we call him in the United States, Eddie Izzard, her, and whatever. Um, and it was just astounding. I, I literally was wiping tears of laughter off the inside of my glasses. It was so funny. And, uh, and also improvisational. They started out doing a bunch of, of riffing, asking audience suggestions, took my suggestion first, and then shat on it. So it's talking about the ages of man and going, oh, we had the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and the Stone Age and what was before the Stone Age? And I raised my hand as I do and said, uh, the Dirt Age. And Eddie was like, uh, well, you know, we ask these questions. Sometimes you get gold. Sometimes you get that. <laughs> so it was promptly ridiculed for my first contribution in any uh, uh, stand-up comedy show, but loved it. And I started going every week. I was in San Francisco at the time, and there was a fantastic, uh, what some people call a boutique comedy club called Cobbs on Fisherman's Wharf. It's much larger now, but at the time, it was a tiny little room, and uh, they, they really trended towards smarter, not always cleaner, but generally clever comedians, you know, it was, it was very good comedy. So I started going every week. And after about a month, I was like, I'm funnier than that guy. <laughs> I'm funnier than that guy, too. There weren't many women at the time, a couple. And so before long, I started an open mic and got laughs the first two times. And I was hooked. And it's been 22 years. That is a long time, yeah. isn't it? Not as long as researching palindromes, but close. Yeah, and you you obviously you enjoy it then, because I would I oh, would have yeah been, I would have been terrified. I did when I was younger. I did entertain the idea of doing something like that, but the idea of you know I, I was in the band when I was younger, and you, when you're on stage playing a musical instrument, you're hiding behind the music a bit. Right. When you're up on stage and it's just you with a microphone, and you've got to make people laugh. I, exactly. That's intimidating. It seems it seems like cheating to me if you're going to bring talent into the equation. It's like, oh, look at me! I can keep time. I can play melodies. Well, oh, whatever. You know, you have to be talented to make people laugh. Maybe. Yeah. I, I don't know. You just either do or you don't. I, I don't know. I think it's I think it's less talent. I always feel like 
because you know there, there's actually an ethic in comedy. Someone who brings an actual performing skill is referred to in the states as a variety act, and they're always looked down upon. If you even move around much, you're looked down upon. So the ethic is basically to stand as totally still as possible and display no discernible talent and, and purely with a few unemotional words to bring an audience to its knees. That's kind of the, the internal logic of stand-up comedy. I, I think that's overdone. I mean, there are guitar comics. Some are pretty bad, but, you know, some are talented and good. I mean, I love Flight of the Concords. You know them, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah they're fantastic. Yeah, so so anyway, just to, to uh, give the quick overview of the thing, I've been a, a paid stand-up comedian, but it's never been my full-time job, but since 2000, mostly in the West of the United States, mostly in highly underpopulated areas that require many hours of driving between shows. It's not unusual to drive 500 miles between shows on uh, say the infamous Tribble gigs. There was a booker, he's retired just recently, but named David Tribble. And he would do a gig where I could be in Coos Bay, Oregon one night, Winnemucca, Nevada the next night, Idaho Falls, Idaho the third night, Billings, Montana the fourth night. And these are hundreds and hundreds of miles between them. Yeah, why would you put yourself through that? <laughs> I really enjoyed it on every level. First of all, I lived in Portland downtown in a fairly crowded urban hipster place. And it, I just felt it was really good for my soul to get out on the highway and just have, you know, they talk about the big sky, just a lot of sun, get out of the rain for one thing, in the big sun and just drive and listen to music or just think about stuff. Like a lot of my writing, both comedic and, and non-comedic, the ideas pop into my head while I'm driving or jogging, things that kind of occupy about half of your brain and just, you know, sing along with good music and cruising in the sun. It's really enjoyable. Yeah. Okay. Fair enough. I mean, sound, sound, you make it sound pretty good. You make it sound good. I, I, you know, the weird thing is I, I'm an introvert and people don't believe that because I'm now a loud, confident introvert, which is in, large cases the result of stand-up comedy but i still like to be by myself i mean the thing people miss this is my thing about about stand-up comedy everyone else is supposed to shut up while you're on stage <laughs> I don't know so it's you. much better than a dinner party to me. <laughs> everyone is just supposed to watch and listen to my brilliant ideas what's not to love about that you say people are supposed to shut up how do you deal with hecklers? Not do you always. have any tips? Well, you know, that's interesting. I, as you know, I'm tall, six foot two. And I realized subconsciously, I, I wasn't doing this deliberately. And I just noticed it after a few years, I would butch myself up on stage because I'm rail thin, which anyone who's seen me would know. I'm, I'm six foot two and 165 pounds, but I, I wear like loose flannel shirts or, you know, things to kind of make myself look thicker <laughs> than I am. I would wear boots. Like I always wore boots on these road gigs out in, and, and, and if anyone doesn't know, <clears throat> when I talk about driving in Nevada, Idaho, Montana, these are all super red Trumpy areas. Everyone's really right wing and conservative and has guns. Uh, <laughs> being physically hit is not your worst scenario. <laughs> <laughs> in these places so it's very important to present a certain physical imposition a certain uh you know don't fuck with me and uh, anyway i just really and i was putting on a kind of a macho stance which you you observe in me but i think if you had met me in 1997 you would not see this element of me and it has literally changed my personality i have found a more macho part of myself that I think was there, was always there, and that I just, for whatever reason, was not interested in. And it, it when I got divorced, it certainly helped my dating <laughs> to be a little more butch when I'm out there presenting myself and posture a bit more. 
I do have this unfortunate tendency to d- strike like a really macho pose, particularly in the bedroom, and then break into giggles, which I think undercuts the whole thing. I don't know, Clara, you could you could give a woman's perspective on that <laughs> because I find it so ridiculous. <laughs> Well, Clara, <laughs> I, I'm I'm saying nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but yeah, but stand up comedy definitely encouraged me to put on that kind of more macho air, and I have gotten heckled very rarely, to be honest. I and I don't want to issue that as a challenge or an encouragement of anybody, because I I like that just fine. I'm a writer. I, I work very hard on the words I deliver, even if they sound like some guy at a pub bullshitting they are very crafted words and I would like to just say my words and have you laugh. Thank you very much. <laughs> and if it reforms your worldview in positive direction, so much the better. But I, I, uh, I, I don't need to engage in verbal, you know, jujitsu with drunks in a bar. That's even if you win, it's not edifying. <laughs> so, not that that. so no one's ever walked up to you on stage and slapped you. No, but uh, I have had a group of ex-convicts waiting to beat me up in the parking lot. Ooh. Oh, because of a because yeah. of a joke. That that was one of my very first pro gigs, like in in two thousand or even nineteen ninety nine. A uh, booker had someone cancel, and I'd had like one gig, and she was like, "I need you to co-headline." which is 45 minutes on stage. I'm like, what part of one gig do you not understand here? I'm absolutely not ready to co-headline a gig. And she was begging me and I'm like, fine, whatever. I mean, you know, you're always torn between, I want to step up and be the hero, but I was so over my head and it was really a, a reckless and stupid thing to do. So I go out and do this gig and she's paired me with this guy who's very experienced. He's like a comedy magician. He'd been doing it like 20 years. And so I went up there and, and it was in Northern California in a really crummy town called Crescent City, which is a declining oil refinery town up near the Oregon border. And it's also very near the Pelican Bay Supermax prison, which is the highest security, roughest prisons in the United States. And uh, apparently, I only piece this together later, but the little shitty guy with very closely cropped hair had just been released from prison after who knows what indignities he suffered and felt the need to establish his manliness immediately and started heckling me. And I I was very new and I didn't really understand the nuance of how hard to hit back or not. And not only was I attacking him pretty harshly, I then stepped off the stage and walked toward him, which I guess you never do. I now have found out. I'm like, that guy's not that big. (laughs) And so I'm walking down and and I was later told people were running out of the pool room down the hall to see the fight that was obviously just about to happen. And somehow I narrowly missed it, you know, like a completely naive whatever, and just turned around and walked back to the stage of the moment passed. But there were four or five guys out in the parking lot waiting for me next to our car. And the the magician guy smelled it. And he was like, you know what? Why don't you wait right here? (laughs) And I'll bring up the car. And when I get here, get in really fast. And then he did that and squealed up. And I hopped in and we, we sailed off. So I've never... Have I been hit? I've had people approach me for sure. I don't remember being hit, though certainly I had a good chance that evening. What was your take on the the Will Smith, Chris Rock thing as a comedian? Oh, you know, the consensus among comedians is that Chris Rock was wrong because it was such a terrible, outdated reference. Like G.I. Jane, who even saw G.I. Jane when it came out? And that was <laughs> 20, 20 years 25 year old movie. Do your job, man. So the joke among comedians is he should have been hit for just making such a terrible joke. But no, uh, Will Smith was completely out of line. You know, the thing that's very interesting, and Will Smith has talked about, I believe, talked publicly about being beaten as a kid or whatever by his folks. Who knows what kind of trauma trigger 
he went through. But if you look at the videotape, you can see he laughs at first. And then his wife says something to him and he goes up and hits him. So there's a dynamic between the two of them that obviously I can't understand, but I don't think it's a good one. I'll just say that. Doesn't seem helpful, um, does it? <laughs> she went public with her alopecia, and it's, it's not like she has cancer. I'm balding. People make fun of me for being balding all the time, too. Uh, whatever. But she did go public with it, right? She could have just worn wigs and not told anybody. But she went public and got publicity for it. I think that makes it fair game. It's a, it's a Hollywood roast. It's a celebrity roast. You roast people about the things they choose to make themselves public about. I don't generally make jokes on people's appearance. But Chris Rock is a very good comedian aside from that outdated reference. So, no, I, I don't think anybody ever needs to be hit. But um, yeah, agree. It, but this, this, I, I do think it, the, the problem for me is I think this whole fear of cancel culture is wildly overblown and the hitting served to support that narrative. Well, it's you interesting know, how, it's, I, how it's become a part of this bigger discussion around what the yeah. community is allowed to do and not allowed to do. Right. Yes, comedians stand a risk of getting hit, but I don't think a comedian has any greater risk of getting hit than any person in a pub ever. Right. If you're in a pub and you say something uncomfortably witty to someone, there's always a chance they might just clock you. Right. I can confirm. Yeah. It's just, it's someone yeah, who spends a lot yeah. of time in pubs. So, so, and, and that's essentially the risk that comedians face. And I think. I'm not sure it does anybody any good to glorify that or, you know, to uh, to play it up and make it sound like we're tremendous heroes. I mean, there's there's comedians in other places who have been jailed and executed, including our hero. So Tati's the obscene of Marinea in Egypt in 280 BC when he was not busy inventing the palindrome. So he, had a yeah, he was cancelled. He was, he was the first yeah, thing to cancel culture. He was cancelled. I'm not sure any comedian has actually been cancelled since then. Everyone talks about cancel culture. Who was cancelled? This is my thing whenever someone brings it up. Name me a comedian who was actually cancelled. Even Bill Cosby was convicted and, and admitted to rape. Then he got it overturned on appeal, not for innocence reasons, and he's doing gigs again. So if he's not cancelled, who is? Who's going to those gigs? <laughs> well, I mean, Bill Cosby's a legend. He's insanely talented. I wouldn't recommend any women go. I, I just don't see anyone being canceled. I see a lot of people claiming to be canceled to sell more tickets, and then they're making tons of money. Is Ricky Gervais's career being hurt these days? Or Dave Chappelle's? Not what it looks like to me. I should be yeah. so canceled. Well, it's, a, it's an interesting thing because it is so nebulous and so subjective as to what counts as being cancelled. You know, yeah. I mean, there's been cases where like a studio didn't want to hire an actor after, you know, four women came forward saying he raped them. Well, it's a free country, right? They're they're allowed to not do business with a rapist. I don't, I don't know that that's really cancelling. They just don't like you because of your awful behavior. I, I guess you could call that canceling, but it's not like the police are stopping you. You know, Lenny Bruce went to jail. He, he physically was thrown in jail. Uh, uh, Mae West was thrown in jail for obscene comedy. Those people were canceled. If the, if the police are putting you in jail, you can say you're canceled. But anything short of that, maybe people don't like you. Well, that, that's definitely a side of it. The public will decide, ultimately. It's like all the, the yeah. 70s, like the British and probably American too, comics from the 70s who just told racist jokes. Right. And they complain yeah, now that nobody Chubby goes to their Brown? shows. And he's still around, right? Yeah, they're, they're all still doing it. Just no one's going yeah. to their shows. And they're complaining that, I suppose that they're using a different term for it, but they're effectively complaining about being cancelled. And really it's yeah. just that the public has moved on and they're not interested in, in hearing right. racist jokes anymore. Mm. And I suspect that with both Ricky Gervais and Dave Chappelle, part of what's going on is they want to stay relevant. And Dave Chappelle flies from gig to gig on a private jet. And he lives in rural Ohio. 
Like what connection to real people does he have? So I, I think part of it is a lot of comedy, we want to be the underdog. We want to be fighting against odds so that people identify with us. And it, it's pretty hard to make that claim when you're flying on private jets to your highly paid <laughs> gigs. And, and I suspect some of this cancel culture thing is just sort of a desperate attempt to still claim you're the underdog, that, that you know, you're fighting some powerful thing. Sure, if you offend people, you're making some difficulties for yourself, but that, that's not the same thing. In, in my view, I don't know. What do I know? But there's there's another side to it though, which is I think this is an interesting discussion. The the role of the comedian mm -hmm. is really to to tell jokes, and and really that's all there is to it. Yeah, to so be it, funny. Yeah, so you don't even have to tell jokes. You can fall. Down. I've who was the the person? I saw this video of a completely wordless comedy act where the comedian came up and started fumbling with the microphone. And just fumbled with the microphone and fell down for like five minutes and then their set was over. Hmm. So you just need to be funny by whatever whatever device you like. Yeah. So but does that mean that you have to to be conscious of social issues or considerate of who's listening when it comes to just making jokes? Mm, that's interesting. I would draw a big distinction between those two things. I don't think you have to be well. It depends how broadly you define social issues. I don't think you have to talk about any political items that are in the newspaper. I think you do need to be aware of just how people live their lives. So in that sense, social issues. So I do not talk about politics much in my act. A lot of my act is structured as, even though I have very strong opinions about politics and I have other ways to express my political feelings, I think part of it is I. I do sometimes get angry about politics in such a way that it's not fun, right? Or that I'm just dreary, <laughs> you know? Might be realistic, but that isn't necessarily comedy. I'll say it's, it's hard uh, to be funny about something that you feel so angry about, I think. Or, or scared about. I mean, yeah. I literally think there is a 40% or so chance that democracy in the United States will have ended in two years by the 2024 election, and that we will be in a right-wing, Christo-fascist regime. So that's not fun. <laughs> you can't, you can't, make many, <laughs> can't make many jokes about that. <laughs> it's just not funny, right? And global warming is, is another example. It's a horrible and very urgent issue, but it's not especially funny. And so it, it doesn't necessarily lend itself. On the other hand, uh, you know, a lot of my comedy act is what I kind of, re I refer to myself as a diary comic. So it's like little vignettes from my life, basically exaggerated stories from real things that happened to me in my life with certain things that also aren't funny. So one thing I, I, I've told people before, my wife is not really in my comedy act because Olga is too good of a wife. And uh, you should use this advice if you get on stage. No one wants to hear about your smart, beautiful, funny, high-achieving, sexy wife. Well, there's a, there's a whole thing in, in comedy anyway. It's To some extent, the audience is meant to be laughing at you as well as me. Yeah, women. yeah. And, and or, you can't or at least talk about identifying how great with you. Okay, or identifying with you. What hmm. percentage of the audience do you think has a near-ideal spouse? It's not a high percentage. <laughs> What percentage has a spouse that they resent or have a lot of complaints about? A very high percentage of the audience. So I'm not sure that you have to be complaining, but you you want things people can identify with. You know, it's like, don't you hate it when your spouse is perfect? Right. That's just not a good story. And, and not even outside of comedy. If, if you win a free trip to Hawaii and then you go there and you eat gourmet food, you know, and whatever. That's not a good story. Nobody wants to hear that. They want to hear about you getting kidnapped by gorillas and escaping and, you know, or something like that. Well, into a volcano. Yeah, yeah. And the, so, um, but anyway, uh, my point is, I, I do think you need to be aware of where people are. I mean, the main thing is to connect with your audience. And if you 
somehow handpick a very unusual audience, then you could say things that are not connected broadly with society. But if assuming you go to a club and it's a bunch of essentially random people you don't know, you need to be in touch with where society is. So for example, uh, and hopefully you're in, you're connecting to society anyway, right? So it's not like you're doing research about these weird, mysterious people. You should be in it, right? You should, hopefully you're living life like all the rest of us. But, you know, I talk about gender a lot in, in my act at the moment and, and changing role models because I think that is something that's going on and we're all going through it. It is kind of confusing. I saw, um, I saw your, your sets in Bristol. Oh, 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 yeah. And there was one really, really good joke in there. I love the joke about Just one. <laughs> the, whole thing, the whole thing was great. One, <laughs> one in particular, I should have said, in particular. Thank you. Uh, where you, you talk about, no, in, in my household, I do all the, the washing up and the cleaning. Right, all the cooking, the cleaning, and the shopping. Yeah, because I'm divorced. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. it's, it's a good joke. Of course, it's not, it, it's not true because you now have another wife. But you, well, so you I was divorced. Yeah. Well, as it turns out, I mean, so that's a that's a practical reality versus a, a literal reality. In fact, I do do the vast majority of the cooking and shopping. Olga and I might differ about the cleaning. Who does how much? Uh, she has a different perspective than me and different standards of cleanliness. So that's an issue. But she's got the better career than I. So that, that's why we moved to Vermont to because she got a professor job. But, you know, here's an example of the gender switch. So many people, mostly women talking to her, they don't say it to me as much, but are astonished that I moved to support her career in this day and age, right? She's a professor at a very highly reputed university in the United States after years of hard work and getting her PhD. People are like, I can't believe your husband moved to support your job. And it's like, I'm a freelance writer and a comedian you've never heard of. How much money do you think I'm making? Yeah, Clara, what and if you're talking about someone on the other side of it, because obviously I'm in the same position as you. Yeah. <laughs> you could wash up a bit more. <laughs> <laughs> No, it, it is it is very weird that in this day and age that's seen still seen by a lot of people as a strange thing to do. Yeah. And again, again, exactly. we're we're in the similar situation. So yeah. it's, it's just <laughs> part of being grown ups in a relationship. You feel right. the beach, don't you? Well, and, and my opinion is you play the hot hand, right? At the moment, you know, like in, think of it as a card game or you know blackjack you got a couple of games on the table you play the hot hand obviously olga's hand is a lot hotter than mine right now i'm working on it i've got plans and you know i hope eventually to supersede her income but who knows yeah, yeah i'm going to fight risk. the tv show yes yes exactly <laughs> the, the syndicated uh, tv show on at like 5 30 every day yeah well it's a high risk strategy certainly my my plan is i figure stand-up comedy, writing books, and then if you do the first two, maybe giving talks, which people will sometimes pay you money for if, you're, if you have enough fame. Each of them might be about a third of a real job, but if I do all three, I might be able to piece it together. So that's, that's my scheme to do eventually some one-man shows at Edinburgh, start working the British comedy circuit as well as the American and sell some books and just kind of get my name out there just enough to be a minor celebrity and make all that stuff work yeah we'll see it will happen it sounds I, like I, a master plan i have confidence it will yeah work. well i will do those things the question is just how much money i make <laughs> from it i'm already doing those things it's, it's in <laughs> motion but that's how i feel yes yeah. That's how I feel. I'm doing these things anyway. I just, I just yeah. want to be paid for it. <laughs> right. But I mean, I think it's a good mix. If you have a, a partnership or a marriage and one person has a steady, you know, successful job, uh, hopefully Olga will in a couple of years have tenure. You can't get much steadier than that. That's a good mix with a more speculative, high risk, art focused job 
that might be nothing and it might have a high payout and most likely somewhere to the lower end of that middle. <laughs> if you're statistically playing the odds, that's probably where it's going to turn out. It gives me the freedom to take that chance. And I think the thing we always talk about as well is that with Anthony pursuing the, the sort of more artistic, non-conventional lifestyle, it, it just opens more opportunities for interesting things to happen. Exactly. So for, for example, going and spending a week at the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. Right. Helping with a show. Oh, yeah. And, and, and you know, we've, we've done things like go, going to the World Palindrome Champs. The, oh, these are right. things we we would never have had the opportunity to do otherwise and the people you meet just yeah randomly just from from trying to get out there and do things absolutely so, so I th you know a good marriage is it's about you play to each other's you, you play to your own strengths within the marriage and you respect your partner's strengths and i don't want to give a marriage advice though because <laughs> We're supposed to be talking about stand-up comedy. Ah, well, you know, I, I, I think it's important in this. In this, Well, I mean, this relates to my point that you, you asked about, do you need to be in touch with political issues of the day? I think you need to be in touch with social issues of the day. Political issues are optional, but you need to understand how people live and what they care about. And I think this is one of the main issues of the day. How are we sorting out the roles for men and women, what is negotiable, what is optional, what is maybe more intrinsic. I'm not going to try to bear children. I think that's intrinsic. I, I'm, I'm leaving that to the ladies, but I think almost anything else is negotiable. I suppose as well, I think for some people going to see a comedy gig, if they want to go see a political comedian, they will go and see a sure. political comedian and then otherwise if they're just going to see not just going to see but that they're, they're going to see some stand-up they're going to an open mic or whatever they don't yeah. necessarily want somebody's politics wrenched in halfway through a, a set right. that's otherwise about like you say the social issues or whatever well there was an incident recently where you know one thing comedians do is is we'll do guest sets on other shows sometimes and, and especially if you have a friend who's doing a comedy and you say, hey, I, I want to try out some new jokes. Can I get a guesty on your show and you know, do five minutes, 10 minutes of some new material? Sure, come on in. Well, John Mulaney, the very successful comedian who's not particularly political, gave Dave Chappelle a 10 minute guest set on his show and Chappelle did all of his anti-trans material. And that's exactly what happened is what you talked about. People paid a lot of money to see John Mulaney, who's not either anti-trans or particularly political. And all of a sudden, ah, you know, that's not what I asked for. And, and so that can be a problem, I think. So but I also think it's a general problem with the way comedy is marketed. I mean, generally speaking, at least in the States, if you go to a, a club, especially in a smaller town that has comedy once a month, they just say comedy. They don't say political comedy, raunchy comedy, not one-liners or whatever. It's like, would you go to see a band if it just said music? Exactly. <laughs> I've, I've made, you know, I've, I've made this exact point about poetry. This is the problem with poetry. Oh, okay. Because with poetry, you get that. You just say a poetry reading. And there are so many different styles of poetry. Mm. You, wouldn't, right. you, wouldn't go to, you wouldn't go to a concert and watch a death metal band followed by a jazz band followed by a young pop God. star that, you know yeah <laughs> right right um, pop, for some pop. reason that in poetry you all meant to mix yeah together. i i think it's an important in, when you think about that when people remember like poets it's when there was some kind of brand when you had the beat mix for example and mm -hmm. then you had a, a sense of what kind of poetry it would be and it was a kind of a movement and people had certain similarities and they were friends and you know interacted and were actually in each other's poems or whatever that's very often when it's successful so there, there should be a lesson in those of us who try to put on shows from time to time i don't think anyone's going to come to palindrome fight and be upset that palindroming is going. <laughs> hopefully we're getting the message out so actually, what, what is the, the scene like? Let's call it the scene, the, the comedy circuit, I suppose. What, what is it like? Because my image of it is a bunch of comedians sitting in the basement 
chain smoking, discussing ideas. That's my that's my naive cartoonish image of what it's like. Not being so in the much of the chain smoking anymore. There's a lot more smoking in England, especially vaping, than there is in the United States. That really struck me during oh. my recent visit. Don't see much of that at all over here. There's there's like different circuits or different levels. You have the theater gigs are famous people, TV famous people like your John Mulaney or Dave Chappelle or whoever in England, it would, you know, be Jimmy Carr, or I guess he'd be stadiums, but uh, Stuart Lee or somebody like that, Josie Long. Or, and then uh, in the United States, you have the club circuit. I think that's also in England. You have jonglers, are they still around? Yeah. yeah. Uh, that kind of thing. So that's a very formalized set. You know, my in the States, it's 90 minute shows. First comedian does 15 minutes, second comedian does 30, third does 45. The third one, maybe you've heard of a little bit from TV or whatever, maybe not. And then the sky's the limit for everything else. You have a, like in, in small towns, you have a weekly or monthly gig and they just scrape together whoever they can get to drive there. Uh, and, and then it could be, then it tends to be raunchier and a little more dirty. And that's a lot of the stuff that I've done, quite frankly. In bigger cities, you have showcases where you're going to have people doing five to 10 minute sets and there might be eight or nine of them in a show. And so then you'll get a lot of, those can often be excellent. In a place like New York, all of them will be famous, <laughs> mostly or, you know, in one way or another, sometimes within a niche, sometimes only on TikTok or something, but most people have some kind of claim to fame. And then whatever entrepreneurs want to put together otherwise. One of the greater comedy shows I saw in uh, the early 2000s, they called themselves, the one was like Monsters of Comedy, and then the next one was Comedians of Comedy. But it was a lot of people who are, are more famous now, but sort of alternative comedians like Patton Oswalt or Maria Bamford, uh, Tig Notaro, Brian Posehn. Zach Galifianakis, who now is a big movie star. Mm -hmm. And they just put together their own tour. And they got six or seven vaguely compatible, you know, smarter than average, a little more alternative than average, not doing jokes you've heard before in one way or another, uh, and put together their own tour and just booked clubs, just paid the clubs for the room for the night, and took all the money at the door. And that was a huge success especially artistic. I don't know if they made particularly money, but definitely one of the best shows I've ever seen. And all of them have gone on to be very famous and, and beloved comedians. So maybe we should do something like that. Maybe you should do Poets of Poetry. And uh, <laughs> or we could do a mixed trends. show. Like, does anyone do a mix of comedy and poetry? It seems like a natural mix. I mean, there are certainly stand-up comics who've incorporated poetry into their into their routine, but it's normally intentionally bad poetry. Or, right. Or, no, you know, no. Or, 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 yeah, no. But I'm thinking of, like, a show that is just explicitly a mix of poetry and straight-up, perhaps serious poetry and, and comedy. And just lets you know from the maybe even a, a musician or two Thing to explore with it might be something we could do profitably mm. well i was thinking earlier you know in, in anticipation of this discussion i was thinking about the relationship between poetry and comedy there are some similarities uh, quite often well if i'm right say if you're writing a sonnet if i'm writing a sonnet i'm thinking about writing the the end couple at first and then working back to structure it so everything ah, all the end couple like it's just like line. yeah it's like having a punchline right. and then dealing with start with your punchline right the, yeah realizing that the setup is that's interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. You want to, you want to land it right. Well, I mean, and, and just practically for doing a show, it's a person in a microphone. Right. So, I mean, uh, uh, even adding a musician complicates it a fair bit because you know, I always see, you know, bands and they're taking 20 minutes to set everything up and get all the, the sound levels right. But if it's poetry and comedy, sell it as either highbrow comedy or funnier <laughs> i think it might get some people out to agree to go see poetry who might like go oh this is going to be dreadful <laughs> otherwise poetry skeptics who might not realize how charming and amusing it can be 
a sign at the door. So remember, laugh at the comedians. Laugh at the comedians, <laughs> don't laugh at the poet. <laughs> Yeah, that's that be... I think that's that's a potential problem there. That if you're going to mix it up, people you get this momentum building when you're watching comedy, uh, and you see yeah. act after act, and you just keep laughing. So if a sudden right. the poet comes on, you're just going to be looking for what's funny about them, and that, <laughs> that's going to destroy some poets' egos. <laughs> right, they unless they're the funny project. poets. I've I've heard some funny poetry. Yeah, you you could have funny poetry with stand up, but but uh, or the other thing is you could just divide the show in half. Like the first half is poetry, and then the second half is comedy. Come for the poetry, yeah. stay for the laughs. Yeah, and and you know some people might show up at the interval and skip the poetry, but you still have their money. That's, that's <laughs> the poet, the poet stream. <laughs> the goal of all poets: there, make money without. Yeah, that's without right. Anyone caring. I'm one of the biggest earning poets in the United Kingdom. Nobody reads me, but yeah, <laughs> look how much money I've made. Well, I mean, it's nice to pay bills, right? I, 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 I'm not particularly materialistic, and I, I don't think artists should have to take a vow of poverty, but I think people can over glorify the lack of money. I accept it. I don't love the lack of money <laughs> from doing comedy and writing. I'd be perfectly fine if that were not the situation. But it, it would be good if you don't have to sleep on a bare floor or something just to be a poet. Bed of books, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, you have, you have a, a new routine based on your your religion or your philosophy. So yeah, I'm into Taoism, which is the ancient Chinese what? philosophy. Why, why um, am I wrong if I call it Taoism? It's written Taoism. It's pronounced Taoism, and then if you're in the scene, we just use these now. That gets back to the Wade Giles system of transcribing Chinese, which was terrible. I don't know who Wade and Giles were. I do believe they're British, sorry. Um, went to England sometime in the 1900s and had the worst tin air possible. These are guys, so the, the largest city in Southern China is called Guangzhou. Right? They pronounced it Kwong Chu. Like, that's a pretty bad ear. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's just Chinese characters are not of our alphabet. So you're always approximating sounds and trying to represent them in, in a completely different script. But they were not very good approximators. So, so they wrote, the sound has always been doused. The Chinese language did not change during any of this time just the attempt to represent it in, in Roman letters. Okay, so I, I have to say it as Tao, but I'm I'm allowed to spell yeah. it with a T because that's more useful. Yeah, and I've gone back and forth. So I have a website called Taoish, T-A-O-I-S-H, you know, like Jewish, Taoish. But I spelled it with a T just because everyone writes it with a T in the West. And, and all of us who are interested in this spend a lot of time wrestling. Do I go to the D to be more accurate and have it pronounced correctly, but then no one will ever spell it the right way? And if it's a website and they spell it wrong, they never find your website. So it's frustrating. But dang, Wade Giles, I hate those guys. But yeah, so Dow, Dowism, Dowish. It's a very slim book of uh, two, two classic slim books of wisdom. From about 300 BCE, the Tao Te Ching and the Chuangzi. Uh, the Tao Te Ching is pretty well known. It's been translated like 800 times by everyone from eminent scholars to popular writers to even like Alistair Crowley translated it and Timothy Leary translated it. The two of the absolute worst, most ridiculous translations you'll ever see in your life. So that that's in the United States, it's pretty common for college students to have a copy of the Tao Te Ching. It's good stuff. It's just good wisdom. I stumbled on it when I was 13. My dad had a book on the bookshelf called Sources of Chinese Tradition. And I was like, wow, this is great. And I've just kind of been reading it and trying to follow it. You know, I've tested it in my life many times and it rings true consistently. The Tao Te Ching is the second best selling book in world history after the Bible. Still in print. 2,500 years later, much less known as the Chuang Tzu or Zhuang Tzu, 
Again, Wade Guile spelled it C H U A N G dash T Z U. Nowadays, we tend to spell it Z H U A N G Z I, but it's pronounced Zhuang Zi correctly in either case. That's the one that is undervalued and really great, I think. I've actually been described as a Zhuangzian comic in a book on calling and non Western faiths, which is kind of amusing, but basically true, I think. Thomas Merton, do you know him? That uh, is a, oh, yeah, a, yeah. Yeah, the... a, a contemplative, did a version. He's, he doesn't speak Chinese, so it's not technically a translation, but he did a version of the Chuangzi that I highly recommend anyone who, who wants to dip their toe in the water. The first one is kind of wacky. It's mythological. It's like there's a giant bird 10,000 miles long, you know, but skip a couple into it and read like rifling the trunks. It's a lot of folksy, down to earth wisdom that, that really is a lot like stand up comedy. If you think of like a rural comedian with an accent who's kind of like a storyteller, like in the United States, they'd be from the South and they're like, well, my poppy used to tell me, you know kind of stuff like that. And uh, just a lot of really great insight. So like rifling the trunks is one that starts out saying, uh, you know, uh, people who have a lot of valuable stuff, they want to put it in a trunk and lock it with a bunch of chains and ropes. And that just makes it easier for somebody to steal it because it's all in one place. And their only worry is that the ropes will break and it will spill out on the ground. They want your chains and ropes to stay firm. And then he uses it in an, as an analogy to describe a dictator who was the attorney general of a province of China and then took it over because he had bound it up with the laws and regulations that made it easier for him to steal it. And then it goes into a timeless bit of social justice where he says, a poor man will hang for stealing a belt buckle, but let a man steal a nation and he's proclaimed as hero of the century. And it's all, this is all like in a page and a half of just really exquisite writing and, and it's so good. The good part's really good. And then depending on the translation, there's a, a translator named Hinton who revealed a level that I wasn't familiar with that there's a bunch of names. And normally it's just, you know, Cho Li said this and these Chinese names, but apparently they're not really names and they all have meaning. So he translated the names, which you normally would not do. And they're all like, a man named Hunchback No Lips was walking <laughs> the street <laughs> and he met Duke Parade Elegance. <laughs> So it's it's really like wild satire. I don't know if you ever read, there's an American writer named Hunter S. Thompson, who's mm -hmm. a former sports writer and then wrote really savage satire. A lot of it is kind of like Hunter S. Thompson, savage satire and timeless deep wisdom. And then uh, an epistemological critique of language and concepts and valuing craftsmen. They're, sorry, there's not a lot of women in this era, but um, I mean, they had women, but they weren't featured in the stories. Probably about the same number. Anyway, you know, but just saying like a guy who, a woodworker, or even he, a, a famous example he uses is butcher, dig. Like a butcher is a really, in this era, a really low class job. It's stinky. You're working with corpses of animals. It's bloody. It's a mess, right? It's like a very low status job. But he presents this butcher as a paradigm of Taoist wisdom because he masters it so effectively. His knife avoids the bones. He finds the little cracks between the joints. He's worked for 10 years and his knife doesn't need to be sharpened. He slings through. If he hits a tough spot, he slows down and intuits the spot to go to. So he has the emperor going, I've learned my wisdom from a butcher. Can you believe it? <laughs> so it's a lot of this kind of anti-authority, folksy, common people. It does celebrate feminine virtues to a great degree, part of which comes from the fact that it was written in what's now called the Warring States period, which was an era of a bunch of small kingdoms before China itself was China. There was no Chinese empire. And it was just a, 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 just a brutal time of war and warlords and killing and slaughter and macho, everything. And it champions a lot of quiet, feminine, non-macho 
opposition to that. Yeah, so yeah, so I'm doing Taoist. Yeah, you have to turn this comedy. into comedy. You have to turn this into comedy. Huh? Yeah, How? yeah. So um, I'm uh, uh, I'm going to the 15th International Taoist Conference, Conference on Taoist Studies in Massachusetts in the United States in two days. So I wrote an article for them. It was my first scholarly publication, uh, peer reviewed and all that. And it was called Comedians as Taoist Missionaries, in which I argued that stand-up comedians, at least in the circuits that I work on, are effectively doing the work of Taoism. They're, they're doing Taoism whether they've ever heard of it or not. Because it's a lot of this making fun of authority figures, you know, uh, privileging the, the wisdom of common people and workers and, and that sort of thing. And it, it's a lot of dualities, non-binary non dualities. You've heard the famous yin and yang. So whenever something comes on so strong, it's always championing the, the opposite pole of that. So anyway, so I, I wrote this essay about that, including my one Taoist joke, which I now need to expand into 30 to 40 minutes in two days. Stretch. Yeah. Um, well, let's hear, uh, let's hear it now, anyway, for the just yeah. The so, uh, uh, yeah, I'm really into Taoism. I've actually become a Taoist missionary, which means I stay home and mind my own goddamn business. <laughs> and so, what that means on a lot of levels, uh, Taoism is the least proselytizing philosophy or religion in the history of the world. It's it's very uncool to try to talk to anybody into joining it. <laughs> If we're just kind of against that. The whole thing is not meddling. Like the main ethic of, of Taoism is to figure out the Tao is just kind of like the way the world works, the way the universe works, the way people work, either on a, a micro level or overall. And so the whole thing is figure out the way the world works and stop meddling with it. Stop fucking it up. Right? So the, 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 I think uh, the simplest example that works in so many situations is just like nature. Don't try to improve on nature. Like people like dam up rivers and like fill in flood marshlands so that you can have more land to build things on. And like, oh no, we we're out of wetlands. And now, now there's problems with the water quality and with flooding. And well, yeah, that nature had it all worked out until you came in and started meddling. So just back off and, and let things be. And so, but that also goes into proselytizing. It's just like, you know, they'll figure it out. <laughs> or they won't, and then that's their problem. Maybe that's their nature. Maybe his nature is to be an idiot, and it's not my job to make him better, you know? <laughs> so that's partly the, the Taoist attitude. Uh, very low ego, you know, it's kind of, so the, the, the main tack I'm going to take, don't tell anybody, because I want the element of surprise. Is, um, I, I'm, this, I'm this is uh, I think this podcast is going to come out well after that you've okay, good, done good, this good. Anyway. So, so basically I'm going to come out with a big tongue-in-cheek anti-Buddhist attitude <laughs> I'm going to make fun of Ricky Gervais and Dave Chappelle it's like I'm not one of these comics that comes out and attacks gays and fat people like a third grade bully they always wanted to be but didn't have the guts. Third grade is like eight years old, eight, nine years old. So I don't know. What would you call that in England? Year four. Yeah. Year five. Year four, year five. Okay. Do you call that fourth form? I've seen, no, just year five? Yeah, form's a bit old fashioned now. Yeah. Okay. So year five. Okay. All right. I'll just say 10 years old or nine years old, whatever. Yeah, no, I think it, if you want to if you want to be an edgy comedian, you need to attack someone that people wouldn't even think of criticizing. People who are like, you know, untouchable, almost sacred. That's why I hate fucking Buddhists, <laughs> sanctimonious pricks. Oh, you don't eat meat. A lot of people don't eat meat. It's not that special, buddy. I don't eat milk duds, but I don't have to work it into every conversation I've ever had with somebody. <laughs> So, yeah, and then, like, now me, I'm Taoist. Totally different. <laughs> I like those Buddhist fuckers. That's kind of the tack I'm going to take. And a, a lot of Buddhists, a lot of Taoists are also sort of Buddhists, or they're really into Buddhist ideas. So that's, yeah. that's well, see, yeah, I get it. That's why, that's why. It'll be edgy. It'll be interesting. Yeah. Yeah.
most uh, most people wouldn't know the difference really between what Buddhists do and what's what Taoists. Right. Well, but this is at the International Taoist Studies Conference, so it, oh, it'll be a different know. spin. <laughs> but yeah, no, but I want to do this. I want to do this bit in clubs too, just in general. I've had a little success. I've done it twice so far at clubs in Vermont. The first time it was a little patchy. The second time it did much better. You know, you try stuff. Some lines land and other ones don't. Like another one I'm working on is, uh, you know, and it's kind of like exoticizing and appropriating foreign cultures, right? Why do you got to go and worship some 2,500-year-old god from the Far East when right here in America we have a perfectly good 2,000-year-old god from the Near East named Jesus? Okay, bad example. Yeah, so I don't know. I'm, I'm playing around with stuff like it. It'll be interesting. So yeah, anyway, that's, yeah. anyway, 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 we need to wrap up soon. But I want to know. You, you've said this is your mad summer. Yeah, um, we've got we, we've oh talked about palindrome fights. Uh, we'll get a plug I'm in for that. I'm presenting three scholarly papers, one of which is a version of my comedians as Taoist missionaries to the same group, but after I do my comedy show. But I'm 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 doing two papers on. Uh, medieval palindromes. Uh, I already did one at the International Congress of Medieval Studies in the United States, and I'm going to be next month at Leeds at the International Medieval Congress, speaking about Irish monks and their palindrome. John Scotus Eriugena, particularly in his circle in Carolingian time. And then uh, I'm still working on my book proposal. I have a secret TV thing that I signed a non-disclosure agreement that I'm Ooh. doing before I go to Leeds. Okay, um, that's exciting, but you can't tell us anything. Yeah, well, okay. I'll tell you about it at, at, at when, when we get to Edinburgh. It may even be out by then. I don't know what their, their time schedule is. I was recruited to do a TV show because of palindromes. So see, kids? They were looking for quirky. Can you believe someone calling palindromes quirky? How dare they? <laughs> you, can't, you, can't even, you can't even palindrome that <laughs> that would be a tough one that would be a very a very tough one kooky is that yeah he's kooky crick kruk kruk yeah no that's that's pretty much there are some things that are impossible so yeah it's there's a lot going on. and then the best thing of all my grown daughter is coming out to meet me at the end of edinburgh and we're going to travel in europe for a couple of weeks Oh, wow. I'm so happy. So anyway, I digress. <laughs> this has been fun. It has. Uh, should we get one more, one final plug? Yes. Uh, palindrome fight. So remind you. For Palindrome you. fight at the Kilderkin every night except Tuesday, August 6th to 28th at 7.30 p.m. That one? Is that the show you mean? That's I the think one. so, yeah. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> but also, if anyone can't remember that, if you just go to the Edinburgh Fringe website and type palindrome. Last I checked, it's the only palindrome show. There might be a few knowing Edinburgh, but it's it's going to be on the first page of results. And, and I think, yeah. is, is it worth mentioning as well? It's a free show? Yes, very worth mentioning. Or a pass the hat. It's <laughs> whatever you think it's worth. It, but yeah, absolutely free, no obligation, and you can participate. If you go to palindromefight.com, there's contact info and just email us or find us on the socials. If you're listening to this podcast, you've got the social link right in front of you. Click that, get in touch, and see if we can't get you on one of the shows. Yeah, it will be fun. And this has been fun. Mark, thank you. Oh, I forgot to mention one final thing. The winner of each palindrome fight by audience applause wins a genuine Roman coin that I obtained for the uh, for the occasion. Oh, wow. That might not be as amazing in England, where as near as I can tell, every time you garden, you have to like throw a few out that are oh, that that's sold. That's nice. but, where, where have you stolen these from? <laughs> uh, I purchased them. I've, I've, I've gotten into collecting ancient coins. It's my new hobby. Excellent. Yeah. Mark, thank you. It's been great talking to you again. And... I'm looking forward to palindrome fight. Always a joy and looking forward to a pint or two in Edinburgh.